Booker. I'm the OpenStack architect at VMware, and I'm also the co-chair of the DEF Corps committee. Uh, and Chris, you want to introduce yourself? I'm Chris Hodge, and I'm the interoperability engineer for the OpenStack Foundation. Okay. Um, so what we want to talk a little bit about today is uh, some of the interoperability problems that we're seeing in OpenStack today and what the OpenStack community is doing to address those. Um, if you noticed up on the right-hand side of the stage during the keynotes this morning, um, there was a sign about uh, OpenStack being the integration engine um, and being able to incorporate a whole lot of different technologies into a single stack uh, that people can use. Um, whether that's different hypervisors, whether it's containers, VMs, um, uh, even bare metal. Um, one of the things that's very interesting about being an integration engine is it means you have to make a lot of stuff look at some level the same. Uh, and especially when we look across different OpenStack clouds, uh, maybe they come from different vendors, maybe they're public and some are private, uh, and some are private hosted, some of them are appliances, some of them are distributions. There's a lot of different ways to consume OpenStack. Um, and it's very important uh, increasingly that uh, we figure out ways to make things more interoperable across all those different um, methods of consumption of OpenStack um, so that we can have uh, real workload portability uh, and keep application developers sane. Um, so Chris, you wanna take it away? Yeah, sure. Okay, so I'm going to start with what is a very brief introduction to DEFCORE. Um, this idea of interoperability with an OpenStack is actually a, kind of an old concept and it was baked into our founding documents. Um, in September of 2012, when the foundation was created, um, the bylaws required a faithful implementation test suite to ensure compatibility and interoperability for products. Um, you know, so right from the beginning when, when OpenStack was created, there was this idea that OpenStack installations should look similar enough to one another that when you call something OpenStack, it, 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 it has a meaning and it has a minimal standard of, 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 of how it runs and how it works with one another. Um, but although this was part of the guidelines, it was something that you know, really didn't take off until um, the DEF Corps Working Group was founded in the fall of 2013. Um, and uh, you know, this, was a, this was a board driven initiative um, you know, you know, to, to kind of fulfill this FITS mandate. Um, about a year later, uh, the first guideline was approved, and this was in the winter of 2014. And this is about the time that I started working with the, working with the OpenStack Foundation. Um, and then after a lot of effort, uh, the, um, the, first, the first guidelines were put, placed into effect in 2015, in spring of 2015. And so if you remember back in Vancouver, during the keynotes, um, we, we got up on stage and, and, and we announced that I think it was 19 products had, had passed the DEFCORE test suite and were carrying the OpenStack powered logo with testing behind it. Mm -hmm. um, since then, there have been five guidelines. The two latest guidelines are for 2015-07 and 2016-01. And why do I bring up the latest, you know, you know the two latest of the, of the five latest guidelines? Well, because if you have an OpenStack product right now that you want to sell and you want to get the OpenStack logo for that, these are the two guidelines that you have to meet. And we've been incrementally changing them, improving them. Sometimes we remove capabilities because we find that they aren't, they aren't necessarily suitable. Sometimes we remove tests because the tests aren't suitable. They don't necessarily necessarily test what we're looking for. Um, or we've been adding capabilities, and we've been trying to expand the capabilities too, you know, including you know, moving out of just the Nova APIs, but also into the Glance and Keystone and you know, Neutron and Cinder APIs. And so, and so there's this kind of uh, attention of pushing and pulling where we're trying to find kind of the sweet spot of what defines interoperability um, and, you know, and, and, and how do we grow that. Um, so what is a guideline? A guideline consists of a few things. Um, it contains components, which is essentially a product. And so the current DevCore guidelines have two different types of components. There's a compute component, which lists all of the things that you would need if you want to run an OpenStack-powered compute. Um, and a storage component, which uh, when, we, when we talk about storage in this context, it's object storage. And so if you want to run es essentially a Swift cluster. Um, and then you can combine these two components to get what you would call an OpenStack powered product. Um, these are the components that we have right now, but there's, not, there's, there's nothing that says that there won't be more components in the future. It's just that right now we're kind of focusing on what we consider to be, you know, kind of in the name of DEF Core, what is the core functionality? You know, what, you know, what, what makes a core OpenStack installation? Um, so these components have within them two different categories. There's a capability. Which is, um, you know, which is essentially saying that some API exists. Um, you know, so for an example of this would be um, creating a server. 
right? That, that, that's a capability. Or getting a list of images or um, attaching a volume. All of these are different type of capabilities that you as an end user want to be able to perform on an OpenStack cloud and do so in a way that's predictable across those clouds. Um, and the way that we measure that a capability exists is by running a test against it. And all the tests, and the tests are chosen by a set of 12 criteria. Um, and then there are designated sections, which are, um, which are a definition of what OpenStack code has to live inside of your cloud for it to be considered OpenStack. Now, not all of the OpenStack code has to exist. Um, you know, and this is in part to allow for um, vendor plugins for hypervisors, for storage, for different authentication methods. Those aren't prescribed, but by and large, it's the APIs and the code that drives the APIs must be running inside of an OpenStack product. So OpenStack, the good news about OpenStack is it's incredibly flexible, right? Talking about these drivers before, they're are any number of ways that you can configure your OpenStack cloud. You, can, you have your choice of hypervisors, dr uh, storage drivers, network drivers. Um, it, you know, it's, it's a really powerful platform. Um, you, you know, and, it's, and, 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 and you've seen that in the marketplace where you know, all of these products have sprung up to, to you know, you know, you know, offering OpenStack with kind of different flavors tailored for different needs. Um, the bad news is that OpenStack is extremely rich and flexible, right? You know, that, that it becomes possible for to, you know, for, 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 for to stand up different OpenStack clouds, and they may not necessarily work with one another. An example would be if you're running OpenStack backed by KVM versus OpenStack backed by Zen. Um, they, they behave differently, and, you, and, you put and they, they run different types of images, and they're sort of, they're, there are some things you get with some and some things that you get with the other. Um, you know, so when you, so when you see like the, you know, this, this multitude of way of con con configuring things, and even more than one way to do things, like, Image upload is, is a perfect example of this. Uh, the, you currently have three different choices of APIs within OpenStack right now. You can use the version one API. You can use actually uh, four different ways. The version one API, the version one API behind the Nova proxy, uh, the version two API, and the version two task API. Um, you know, so this is just an example of things that are all OpenStack, but choices can make it difficult to you know, decide which one's the best way to do it. And on top of this, policy isn't discoverable, right? And so right now, if you have Glance implemented in your cloud in some way, you actually don't know how it's implemented, and, it, and it's difficult to discover. Um, plus, there's a rapid release cadence, and so products built on, you know, there are products that are built on many different versions that are in production, and you want to be able to say that, you know, that, you, that one type of OpenStack can talk to another one, like a Kilo can talk to Liberty. And upstream development has actually done a pretty good job of this in, 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 in kind of providing guarantees about how long APIs will live and what deprecation policies are for that. And so, you know, that's actually one of the nice things about OpenStack where they, where they have decided to take a, a longer view and try to make sure that when an API is there, an API is there for you. Um, you know, but still, there are many tools out there and sometimes it's also hard to know exactly what what clouds those tools support. And so you have a favorite SDK or a favorite tool or a favorite application. You know, how do you know that it's actually going to run on top of an OpenStack cloud? Yeah. Um, and all of this has manifested in, how many people here are familiar with the Shade library? Yeah. So a few, a few hands have gone up. Shade is an interoperability library that was developed by the infrastructure team to, uh, and, and to kind of pave over the differences between all of the donated clouds that, they, that they've seen, uh, you know, th th that they're using in QA right now. Um, but it's also, you know, since, you know since, it w since it's been used as a tool by that, it's also become a popular client to be able to access different OpenStack clouds, and it's, and, and it's become a very powerful tool. Um, so on one hand, it's wonderful that we have this open source community that allows a tool like Shade to exist, but then you have to wonder, you know, if we have an interoperable standard, why does something like Shade have to exist? Um, so here I'll turn it over to Mark. So now that you've got kind of the context for why we care about interoperability between clouds and maybe a little flavor for some of the different variables that are in play, different versions of OpenStack, different policy configurations, those kind of things, um, we thought we'd talk a little bit about some of the challenges um, that are out there today that we're hearing about, uh, both from developers, from operators, from end users, uh, you name it. Um, so. These are, these are a few to kind of get the, the wheels going um, and should give you a kind of a, a down-to-earth feel for some of the things that are, that are out there today. 
Um, so one example that Chris mentioned earlier was image operations. Um, today, if I want to get an image into a cloud, there are several different ways I can do that. Uh, there's also several, several different ways I can do other operations on images, things like listing uh, images. Um, where that manifests uh, in sort of a problematic way is that different APIs and different toolkits, or sorry, different SDKs and different toolkits uh, have chosen to implement sometimes one of those ways. Um, so maybe if I'm using JClouds, then I get uh, the Glance v1 API. Uh, whereas if I use Fog, then I wind up using Glance v2. Um, and those uh, make it a little difficult to, to write a bunch of different apps and make sure that they actually run on the same cloud because all your apps might not be using the same SDK or the same tooling. Um, so image, image operations are just kind of one example of that. Um, and we'll talk a little bit later on about um, something, some of the work that's going on in the community around that. Um, networking is kind of an interesting space as well. Um, there's, uh, when people think about networking in, in OpenStack, they generally think of the two different ways to do networking, uh, which is Nova networking or Neutron. Um, turns out even if you look at just Neutron, which is the vast majority of OpenStack clouds nowadays, um, there's a lot of nuance in how uh, you can set up your Neutron networks as well. You can use provider networks, um, you can use floating IPs, you can do tenant routers. Um, there's lots of different ways to do networking. Um, and particularly external connectivity has come up as kind of a pain point. Um, there are certain clouds where when you boot a VM and attach it to a default network, you've automatically got an externally uh, routable IP address. Um, with others, you need to actually go attach a floating IP to that. Um, so depending on what product or what cloud you're using, um, you may wind up with lots of different ways to do external connectivity. Uh, so that's one that's kind of come up a lot as well. Um, we talked a little bit about policy and configuration discovery. Um, turns out in lots of different clouds, especially in the public cloud space, um, people are pretty opinionated about the policy settings that they pick. So just for, for background, for those of you that might be new to OpenStack, um, almost every API in OpenStack winds up being controlled in some way by a policy.json file, which says this is an action that's available to regular users, or maybe only to admins, or maybe to some other role. Um, there are default settings that sort of ship with the upstream projects, um, and often those are tweaked for various reasons. Uh, so maybe I don't want to expose the Glance v1 API to um, the general public in my cloud because I have uh, performance issues or security concerns. Um, so it turns out there are quite a, quite a number of providers that actually disable you from using Glance v1 uh, as, a, as an end tenant. Um, same thing goes with some of the other APIs. Uh, those, are, those are just kind of examples. Um, but there's not a good way today to do discovery of policy settings. Um, so if I'm looking at a couple different uh, clouds, a couple different open source products, maybe a private cloud and a public cloud, um, I basically have to try and catch to figure out how I'm gonna, gonna do some of those operations uh, and what uh, ways of doing that are available to me, um, which is not a great way to go. Um, anytime you're injecting a whole bunch of if loops into your code when you're writing an application, you've probably got an area that could be simplified. Um, API iteration is also kind of a concern. Um, so if you've seen some of the, uh, I think they so showed some of the keynotes this morning, uh, and if not, then the user survey certainly has them. Um, if you look at who's adopting what versions of OpenStack and what's in production today, there's actually a bit of a lag. Um, there are not many production Metaka clouds today. There are quite a few uh, Liberty clouds. There are even more, I think, Kilo clouds still. Um, so, you know, there's, there's sort of a, a lag in adoption. Um, uh, so that, that kind of manifests itself in uh, terms of API deprecations. When you look at, say, the top three or four versions of OpenStack out there, it is possible that you may see AP, APIs deprecated and or removed over the course of three or four different releases. So if I have, say, you know, an ice house uh, private cloud, and I'm also wanting to uh, run some of those applications on, say, a, a public cloud that's running something much newer, uh, the same APIs may not be available to me in both places. Um, and so that's, that's kind of an interesting um, nuance that people run into when they think about the full lifespan of what's being adopted uh, in OpenStack today uh, and how durable some of those, those clouds are. Um, provability is, is an interesting point for us on the, on the DevCore committee. Um, when we uh, receive testing results, uh, we mentioned earlier that uh, in order to get a uh, OpenStack powered logo, you actually have to submit test results that show that your, your product actually uh, does all the things that the DEF Core guidelines say it should do. Um, at the end of the day, that's really a text file that you're submitting to us. Um, so it is possible that you could fake those results. Um, uh, we would hope that you wouldn't, and there's actually uh, legal consequences for doing that built into the uh, logo contract. Um, but it is possible uh, for us to uh, receive falsified data. 
Um, and implicit test requirements are, are kind of an issue for us as well. Um, when we look at what's in the Tempest tree today, uh, the vast majority of the, the tests that we have today for our suite um, are, are Tempest tests. Um, a lot of cases, the Tempest tests make opinionated choices about how they set up the thing that they're actually going to test. Um, so for example, if I have a test that says start a VM, um, well, if I'm going to start a VM, I actually need an image first to do that. Uh, and in some cases, the Tempest uh, test may pick, say, the Glance V2 API uh, to uh, accomplish that image upload in order to set up for the real thing that they want to test. Um, well, maybe it turns out that Glance V2, for some reason, doesn't meet the rest of our criteria, and that's not a thing we want to require everybody to offer. Um, well, how do we uh, ask people to run that test if we don't require the, the thing that is required to set up the, the test? Uh, so that's, that's a bit of an issue for us now that we're working with uh, QA to rectify. Um, and then also finding good data on what's actually used. Um, one of the criteria that we have uh, is that uh, capabilities that we require in DEF core should be widely deployed. Um, we're essentially a trailing indicator of market acceptance in a lot of ways. Uh, and a lot of the other uh, criteria actually kind of center around that theme as well. Uh, things like, um, is it widely supported by SDKs? Uh, is it widely supported by external clients? Um, if you have something that's not very widely deployed, the chances of, say, JCloud or Fog um, picking that up and, and supporting it are probably pretty small. Um, so at the end of the day, uh, we have to make a judgment call on what we think is widely deployed out in the industry among private clouds, among public clouds, among appliances. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, uh, data to pour through there. Um, and sometimes it's hard to figure out what, what good data uh, there is that's uh, readily available that doesn't require uh, weeks and weeks of research. Um, project documentation as well. Um, this is kind of an interesting thing that's uh, come up a couple times over the course of the past year. Um, Projects often offer different ways to do things, um, and sometimes the, there's some sort of tribal knowledge about what ones you really should be using. Uh, so for example, if you look at the Nova community, there's, there's sort of a lot of tribal knowledge that says, yeah, maybe you don't want to support uh, or uh, expose, sorry, with Glance, you don't want to expose uh, the V1 API externally. That was really a thing that we built for Nova, so Nova should be the only thing talking to it. Uh, and maybe you shouldn't expose that to the outside world. Um, well, uh, if you look at some of the documentation, that wasn't always there. Uh, and so there are a lot of products that do expose uh, Glance V1 to the outside world. Uh, and in some cases, it's perfectly fine to do so. That's a choice that they, they've uh, made. Um, other things uh, we ran into, uh, we talked a little bit about Keystone V2. Um, it is uh, fairly recently, I think, been deprecated finally, um, but ours on the road to it. Um, but it's been listed as supported for quite some time. And when we go talk to the developers from Keystone, they actually said, you know, nobody's really maintaining that anymore. Um, it's just sort of sitting there. Um, so as an end user, uh, should I really consider that thing to be a supported thing, or should I be looking at something else? Uh, so again, it's, it's a little bit of tribal knowledge sometimes that we have to work our way through. Um, other challenges. Uh, we talked about discoverability. Uh, we talked about it mostly in the context of policy. Uh, there's also versioning uh, that we have to worry about, both of the APIs and of the underlying cloud uh, in some cases, um, because there may be market difference, uh, not necessarily um, functionally, but maybe in terms of uh, performance or security uh, of, of the way that clouds do things between different versions of OpenStack. Uh, so that's kind of important as well. Uh, image formats, uh, there's not a, a good API today that says this cloud supports um, VMDK uploads, uh, and this one supports only raw uploads, and this one only supports QCOWs. Uh, in fact, in a lot of cases, Glance will just let you upload whatever uh, image format you want. Um, and then it turns out when you try to boot from that thing, that doesn't always work. Uh, and so that's kind of a pain point for a lot of folks. Um, so you know, again, that, that really boils down to what does the cloud provide and how does it actually do that uh, is an important thing for people to be able to discover. Um, and if you're interested in discoverability, I'll say, uh, I don't have the time on top of my head, but there is a, a whole session on that later this summit, so look for that on your schedules. Uh, and we'll, we'll have some interesting talks. Um, lack of awareness about DEF Core. There's, there's, DEF Core is a relatively new thing. Um, so like Chris was saying, uh, we only really started having guidelines being enforced in the past year. Uh, so for a lot of folks, this is still, still new material that they're still uh, figuring out. Um, so among, among the developer core within OpenStack, um, there's still some confusion about you know, what, what kinds of things should products or projects be taking into account when they're making technical choices. Things like, do we need to keep this API on life support or do we deprecate it? Uh, things like, what should our policy settings be? Things like, how should we write our tests? Uh, in our case, it turns out it's kind of important that you don't use admin credentials when you write your tests if you don't need them. 
um, because that way we can have end users actually run these tests against, say, public clouds where they don't have admin credentials and prove to themselves that uh, these clouds actually do, do the things that they uh, say they're going to do. Um, and among consumers as well, um, it's still kind of interesting that um, although we've kind of been up in the keynotes a couple of times now, um, people still don't necessarily have a good feel for what uh, having an OpenStack powered logo means for them and why they should care. Um, and some of that's just because it is very simply a badge. It is a, a logo that you can put on a product, right? And the right to call yourself OpenStack. Um, under the hood of that, there's this whole list of things that that means your cloud does. Um, but those things aren't in that logo. Um, and so while it's very easy to look at a logo and say, okay, that's probably a cloud I should gravitate towards and, and look at. Um, it doesn't actually give you the full nuance of what's under the hood. Um, so kind of getting to that next level of understanding can be uh, a little challenging for folks. Um, and then finally, mapping uh, capabilities to APIs. Um, when we define a capability in DEF Core, um, we generally do that in, in sort of a loosely plain English sort of way. Um, like Chris was saying earlier, it's things like create VM. Uh, it's things like upload image, list image. Um, in some cases, that doesn't always uh, have a readily apparent mapping to a particular API. Uh, because like I say, you know, maybe there's multiple versions of an API, or maybe there's multiple ways to do a certain thing in OpenStack. Um, so it's, it's kind of helpful for us uh, to be able to map the two together, and that's kind of a project that we're, we're brainstorming about right now. Uh, and moreover, um, when we talk about the actual tests that we use uh, to, to test those capabilities, there again, they may map to several APIs, uh, in some cases uh, as part of sort of a test fixture, and in some cases the thing that we're actually trying to test. Uh, so there's a lot of work for us to do in, in sort of sorting those things out. So um, lots, of, lots of interesting challenges. Uh, like we say, you know, it's, it's fantastic that OpenStack is so incredibly rich and flexible and lets us do all these things. Uh, but it obviously makes a little work for us uh, when we talk about interoperability. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we're doing on it, uh, about it, so that we don't uh, leave you all with the impression that these are just problems that nobody cares about. Um, clearly, a lot of people actually do care about these. Um, we've had a whole lot of discussions over the past uh, year and a half and some pretty tangible actions that have come out of that. Uh, and that's also why you'll see uh, DEF Core and the OpenStack powered logos show up in, in things like keynotes and on the OpenStack marketplace. Um, so first of all, um, we exist. Um, plain and simple, the OpenStack Foundation and the board of directors cared enough about the interoperability topic to actually set up a group to work on this. Uh, and to actually invest quite a lot of, of sort of marketing push um, and sort of um, put some, some, some real wood behind that arrow. Um, so that was, that was something that was um, uh, concerned all the way up to the board level. Um, so it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting to see uh, OpenStack, um, you know, marking that as a thing that they really care about. Um, and you know, we, we actually do use a measurable standard. We have a set of tests that you have to pass. Um, so there's, there's kind of a, a standard being set and improved all the time. Uh, we roll out a new guideline about every six months. Um, so that's kind of the, the cadence. Um, matches pretty well with the OpenStack software releases, uh, although we're, we're offset by a couple months. Um, so you know, it's, a, it's a continuously improving standard. Um, it's very difficult to get a lot of the research done on these decisions. Um, and so it can be a little bit slow at times. Um, but the fact that we, we've actually got a standard uh, that folks can see, uh, can get their heads around, and have tools to test um, makes a big difference. Um, working with vendors to understand challenges of downstream deployments. Um, in some cases, uh, we get it wrong. Uh, we may require a capability or put something into advisory status, and all of a sudden we get a bunch of public clouds or a bunch of uh, private cloud distributions uh, raising their hands and saying, we don't support that and we don't have any intention to, and here's why. Um, we do have pressure release valves built into the system for that. Um, so we can actually flag capabilities and say, OK, we got this one wrong. It, it doesn't actually meet criteria because of x, y, z. Uh, and we can make that non-required. If, 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 if I can actually say something, add something to that also. Um, uh, it's the, these, these safety release valves are actually, I, I think maybe I'm realizing that um, we, I, there have been vendors that have approached us and have said, we're interested in, in passing and, and you know and passing these tests and then when they see they're not passing some tests they go away and they try to understand why that is and maybe you don't maybe we don't hear back from them what the what you know I as a, a, a foundation staff member but also as a, a deaf core working group member would like to see is more vendors coming in and saying these are the these are the problems that we're having you know so that we can try to understand and and, and work with them on solving them together so really if you're if you're a vendor you know you know um, 
you know, don't be shy about expressing your problems because, because really we want the standard to be the best standard that it can be and that, and that means making sure that uh, uh, um, downstream, that the, the, the vendors are producing products that are um, you know, compliant with the, with the minimum standard, but also that we're setting that standard fairly and that, um, you, you know, and, and, and if it's not fair, what we can do to make it better, e either by amending the capabilities or, um, or amend, you know, or, or, or fixing the problems in upstream testing and upstream development that would, you know, you know take these problems away. Yeah. You know, so 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 really, you know, on this on this point, I'm just strongly encourage the vendors to, you know, really approach us, and you know, and talk because you know we're, you know, it's we're, that's that's part of the process that you know should be exercised. And kind of on a similar note, um, we also talk spend a lot of time lately talking with uh, developers upstream as well um, to look at um, what APIs are out there, what problems people are having, and what we can do to solve those things. Um, so, you know, we, for example, we've had a lot of talks with the Keystone folks about whether um, V2 was actually going to be maintained or not. Um, and so those conversations were maybe at least one contributing factor leading to the, the sort of deprecation of those APIs since they weren't actually really being maintained very well. Um, on a similar scope, we've, uh, we've kind of had some discussions with some of the Neutron folks around Get Me a Network, um, one of the, the new APIs for um, sort of glossing over some of the implementation details of how to get a, a VM onto the network. Um, and you know various other examples as well. Um, working with QA to improve testing. So we talked about sort of the atomicity problem that we have with some of the tests, uh, where a fixture for a test may require things that DEF core doesn't. Um, so there are cases where we've worked with uh, QA to solve those. Uh, and we've also uh, run into some cases where you know Tempest tests are buggy, uh, or maybe the capabilities that they're testing are buggy. Um, so there, there's kind of a feedback loop uh, being formed there uh, to help us uh, both improve the tests and improve the products. Um, collaborating with technical community to identify key issues with real clouds, public, private, uh, et cetera. Um, so when we talk to, uh, there, there's kind of a, a two-pronged piece here. We talk to end users of clouds when we can, uh, and we also talk to vendors who uh, make OpenStack products. Uh, because it turns out in a lot of cases, vendors can actually aggregate a lot of the feedback that they're seeing from all their customers to us. Um, so being in contact with, with people that are producing those things uh, is important to us. Um, one of the things, for, as an example, that we've started doing uh, is asking that when vendors submit their test results to us, they don't just run the tests that we require them to pass, uh, but they actually run the full battery of Tempest tests. Um, and that gives us an idea, okay, yeah, you passed, great, uh, here's your logo agreement. Uh, but that also allows us to see, oh, you know what, hey, that thing that we were considering adding to the next guideline, five of these new results that we just got in don't actually support that thing. So let's go drill down on that and figure out what's going on there. Um, so it's, it's good, good feedback for us. Um, that kind of uh, reflects back up to the technical community in some cases as well. Um, so we've had feedback about you know, why vendors have chosen not to expose clients V1 to the outside world. We've had feedback about um, you know, there are too many ways to do list images. Um, so those are, those are kind of bits of feedback that we can feedback upstream as well. Yeah, and anybody who submits, you know, who runs, uh, there's, a, there's a project called RefStack which is um, used to, um, as a front end to Tempest. And can be used to submit these test results. Um, you know, really go and run all of the API tests against your cloud if you if you can, and submit those results to us because, um, you know, it, it not only helps us now, but it helps us for the future too. As we refine the guidelines, we're actually able to go back and compare the guidelines against previous test results. You know, and that you know, and it you know, and it's, as Mark was saying, it's a way to see what's out there. And um, you know, so even though we may not be looking at particular capabilities that your cloud has right now. In the future, it can become very important for us to evaluate those. Right. Um, and last bullet is, is uh, providing some meaning for the OpenStack logo. Um, basically, at the end of the day, what the foundation really would like is when people see a product that calls itself OpenStack and has that stamp, that badge on it, um, that they actually know a little bit about what they're getting. Um, and they, that's a meaningful thing that people actually seek out in the marketplace. Um, and so kind of by providing this list of capabilities that you know you're getting when you uh, see that logo somewhere, where you see a product that calls itself OpenStack, um, that's really good, kind of good for uh, the, the OpenStack ecosystem and, and, and users as well.
um, conversations that we're having. Um, so awareness is half the battle. Um, a lot of, it, like I said, in a lot of cases, uh, Dev Core is just so new that people don't really understand either what I, as a developer for one of the OpenStack projects, need to care about or think about, uh, or I, as an end user of OpenStack Clouds, don't know what that logo is really buying me. Um, so we have a lot of discussions uh, both within the project uh, and with, with folks outside of it. Um, so just to give a, kind of examples of, of some of the things that we've had conversations with technical teams about, um, you know, I, I won't bother to read them all through here, but uh, there are a lot of things on the slide here uh, that these are either conversations we've already had uh, or conversations that are actually still in flight um, with a lot of the technical communities um, and uh, looking at what we can require in future standards and what we should probably cut out of our uh, standards in the future as well. Okay. Take this. Okay, so um, so DevCore is now a year old, and you might be wondering what's what's new and how has it changed. Um, well, w one of the major additions that's happening this year um, is networking capabilities are advisory, um, and so this was you know one of the reasons that networking wasn't. Um, uh, a direct requirement in the initial versions of, of, of DevCore was because we had two different networking models. We had Nova Network and we had Neutron. Um, but now it's very clear that the community has, has, has gotten behind Neutron as a networking model. It's become much more mature and much more stable. And so we're, we're going to be moving to requiring network capabilities in the next set of guidelines, which will be approved in um, August of this year. Um, Keystone V2 has been dropped. Um, so previously, we were requiring Keystone V2 and Keystone V3, um, largely because when you installed an OpenStack cloud, by default, both endpoints were running, um, and both were supported APIs. Um, but you know, d d discussion around Def Core and, and di what different deployments were doing has you know kind of you know you know the Keystone team has has, has um, decided to deprecate V2. Um, you know, it, and um, you know so. In some ways, since this is a forward-looking decision of the community, um, it gave us a chance to say that, that V3 capabilities are really the interoperable standard going forward. Um, RevStack.OpenStack.org Revstack, uh, went live um, at the previous summit and started accepting results. Um, and so that's become a place where um, now when you approach the foundation for, for, for the interoperability logo, we require that you upload the results to RefStack. Um, and that does a few things. The first is it, it, it allows the working group to actually look at the results and, and try to make decisions based off of that. But it also provides a public place for, for, for to link to so that customers can see that, yes, you pass these tests. Um, um, we've, also, we've also been looking at how do we expand um, what Def Core covers and um, you know, and the different projects that we cover? You know, as, as we've gone into the big tent world, more and more projects have started to run their own functional and API testing inside of their own projects. And so we needed to have a way where we could start considering bringing other projects in. And um, now, you know, we've, we, Tempest has expanded its ability to run tests via plugins. Um, you know, and this is a way where we can keep the interface for running the tests somewhat similar. You can always run it as Tempest using plugins, but allow for admission of expanding capabilities for Swift, Heat, um, and other projects. You know, so this is something that's been pretty exciting and, um, you know, we worked with the QA team to, to move forward on. Um, you know, and finally, there's been, a, there's been a really good discussion lately, if you've been following the mailing lists, about what to do about the Nova proxies. Um, you know, the reason that the proxies exist is because in the early days of OpenStack, there was just Nova and Swift. Um, but then as projects started to break out and we saw, you know, you know, uh, you know identity and storage and networking, um, you know, break out of this, in order to maintain backwards compatibility, there were these API calls the, that were being proxied through Nova. Um, but now there's an active discussion of whether the Nova proxies are really serving us anymore and if it's time to start thinking about you know, using different proxies. And so this is being reflected in, um, in the capabilities as we begin to add direct API calls for images, storage, and networking. Um, and so this is a pretty, um, you know, this is a pretty exciting development that's coming up, and I think it's gonna add a lot more power and weight behind what you can do with an OpenStack cloud. So coming soon, uh, the Def Core Working Group is uh, putting together a report on the top interoperability issues. Um, do, you, what's, do you know when the deadline for that report is? 
uh, it will probably come out around the time of the next summit. Yeah. So, so look for that um, in, in Barcelona. Um, you know, again, we are, you know, and it's going to be periodically updated so we can measure the progress on the big barriers. Um, you know, and really that's what this last year has been, has been, has been, you know, getting the standard out there so that we can truly understand the barriers that are there in the real world. Um, and I, and I think that in that way it's been a, it's, it's been a, 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 a success. Um, you know, and, and what this is, what this does is, it's, is, is that we're trying to drive conversation, we're trying to create accountability. Um, uh, over the next cycle, one of our, one of the biggest things that we have facing us is working on tests. Uh, there are um, there there are ways that we can improve the tests. Um, you know, uh, an example of this is there are a number of neutron capabilities that are um, require administrative credentials to be able to test them, but you actually don't need administrative credentials to access them. And so this is an example where the Dev Core committee can become you know can become very active in looking at the tests and and. And, um, and modifying them so that, so that they can actually be admitted to the guidelines. It's also looking at the tests and saying, are there unintended side effects from some of the tests that, that, that unintentionally bring in new capabilities? Um, so, you know, and, it's, and this, is, th this is an example that was brought up to me this morning where a test to list images actually exercises the image snapshot uh, capability. Um, but image, I don't think image snapshot is actually a capability we, we require. So in some ways, the, you know, the, you know, you know, there's a particular test that requires an additional capability, you know, almost by accident. So one of the goals is to be able to look at, is, is to look at these tests and figure out how we can refactor them so that these external dependencies can be moved out and you're really testing, you know, that you're truly testing what you say you're testing. Um, uh, you know, so this involves working with the QA community, um, y you know, you know, for, you know, unnecessary admin credential use and, you know, you know, some of these other things. Um, you know, and, you know, and, and what's coming out of this too is a more formal discussion of, um, you know, you know, what it means to be an interoperability test. And there are going to be some great discussions later this week that are happening in both. There's a, there's a DEF Core working session where this is going to be one of, the, one of the big issues, which is going to feed into a joint DEF Core QA working session where, you know, these, you know, these issues will continue to, you know, advise them on, you know, on, on ways forward and how we can collaborate. Um, you know, we're also talking about use cases like NFV. Like, is there, is there a, I, is, is there an argument for looking at special applications like NFV and saying that maybe we should be looking at different guidelines or different standards for what it means to be an NFV ready cloud? And um, you know, and this is you know, and, you know, and, and so this is something that we're going to be looking forward, to, you know, you know, that we're going to be considering going forward in these discussions, so that we can maybe have a little bit more differentiation on a cloud targeted for a particular use. Um, and then there's other stuff. Uh, you know, we are we are an open working group, and um, you know, you if, if you're facing issues, you are everybody is welcome to come and participate and contribute and talk and ask questions. Um, you know, we have weekly meetings on Wednesday mornings. Ooh, lost our text there. Oh. Okay, well, that, that was, was the last slide anyway. So, last slide. so <laughs> are there any questions? How do I play this? Uh, if you have questions, just run to one of these mics for us. Nobody? He was all perfectly clear. <laughs> all right, well, thanks for coming. Thanks.